All right. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to class eight. I cannot believe it. Bittersweet. Um, but I've been excited. I've really had to fight the urge to paint onto that painting we started last week. <laughs> I've been looking at it. I finally just kind of hid it away from myself and uh, started a couple other little ones, which you can see here. Um, so I'm having fun still just kind of playing and experimenting with uh, the idea of it. And in fact, I'm doing two large, well, two commissions, a 30 by 40 and a 36 by 48. And I decided to start both the commissions um, that way. And uh, you can see behind me over here, the Cannon Beach looking one. <laughs> here which i did black and white and but i didn't do any glazing into this is that showing up vaguely um, and i didn't do any glazing so i just went directly in with the paint and then you can see little bits of trees that are kind of sticking out and stuff here those are i just painted right over the top for the most part with the background but i can still see enough of that paint that when i come back in after this background is dried up a little bit um yeah sorry the colors are probably off i will be able to just kind of go back into that and um and then the 36 by 48 i just i did glaze into or barn yeah glaze into are you guys able to see that not very well See if I hold it up at a, and wow. So I, where do I go? <laughs> Maybe I just move the camera. Your left. Let's move the camera instead. Um, it's I basically glazed into it with just two colors. The, nice. the ground is all rolling hills, Eastern Oregon kind of high desert, and then the sky. So I've got it. A lot of information in my ground area and nothing in my sky. The sky is actually gonna be covered with clouds mostly with some really nice blues poking through. But um, so anyways, even though they're, I usually say that, uh, you know, the little paintings are my practice and the big commissions and stuff are my performance where I don't really step out of the box too, too much. All right, let's get that back over here. And, but I decided to, because I've been playing with this enough with you guys and experimenting to try it and attempt two different routes with it. And um, so far, I think both of them are working. So I'm not, you know, even though we've been doing these kind of black and white underpaintings, it's not even how I do a lot of my paintings. I've been doing these to show us how I think about the painting. I think design and values first. There's a lot of painters, a lot of instructors out there who don't you know, teach that way, but that's the way my brain works. And you know, as an instructor, basically I can only teach you what I know works for me. Um, so if you just say, you know what, if I just put the right colors in the right places, I've got my painting. That's how Kevin McPherson approaches painting more. Um, if you know his book, Painting with Light and Color, Bringing the Outside In, I think is the name of his second book. Great painter, great teacher, wonderful guy, really funny. Um, so it's up to you, you know, to keep painting, to keep experimenting, and to see which ways work best for you. There's a thousand ways to make a painting, right? And I'm just trying to give you some tools and to break it down into how my brain thinks about it. And for me, whenever I try to skip past the stage of um, design and establishing my values, I get in trouble. You know, and I definitely get excited by colors, just like everybody else, especially out plain air painting, where I just want to jump ahead. And sometimes I get lucky, but if I want a higher percentage 
hit rate, <laughs> as it were, a higher percentage of successes. Working it up a little bit slower in the beginning saves time in the end. I know I have a lot of saying that I repeat in my head, but one of my favorites and one of the most important or one of the ones that comes back and bites me the most is I like painting, I don't like fixing. <laughs> And it always is sad when people are like, how long did that painting take? And you know, you know, two days, you know, it was wonderful. It just flew off. And it's a way better painting than the painting that took two or three weeks, two months, because I made mistakes early on that I didn't catch. And then I had to fix them and redo and redo. And you know what I mean? And those paintings aren't as fun and they take way longer. And so by slowing it down in the beginning, thinking out what issues may arise during the painting, what's the best way I can approach this painting really, really helps for me. And actually that's one of my goals going forward is to slow down a little bit, to at least slow down in the beginning, do more of the little tiny, you know, thumbnail sketches, do more of the preliminary work on Photoshop or whatever, you know, working on my photos, cropping, doing different things, and making sure that the image is set up for success. And I don't really want to keep making the excuse of I'll fix it while I'm painting. I'll figure it out as I'm getting to it. And in some ways, I would think to myself, well, oh, you're ruining some of the creativity. You're taking away from, you know, the spontaneity of it. But I've definitely found that not to be the case. I found that the more, the firmer guidelines and structure I give myself, the more creative I can get with my brushwork, the more creative I can get with my colors, the more creative I can get with the glow that I'm always chasing or the atmosphere that I'm always chasing. And, you know, oftentimes too, even just picking like a limited color palette that may not be my very typical color palette, but what I'm doing is kind of setting some rules or some guidelines for myself, just like we did with the high key, low key, you know, those kind of things. And then within those guidelines or whatever I've built for myself, that structure, then I can go crazy and I can really push the limits within those limits. <laughs> it's kind of a funny way to think about it. But, you know, you hear musicians doing that a lot, like jazz musicians and stuff like that, where they kind of go, okay, it's in this key, musical key, it's got this rhythm, and now we can jam. And it will sound coherent, it will sound harmonious, you know, it's not all over the place, but it's also free-flowing, lively, energetic, and, you know, in a jazz ensemble or something, everybody kind of knows where they're at. And I kind of think of myself as a jazz ensemble. I'm a bunch of different painters all within one, you know, messy head up here, um, all trying to get along and uh, not, yeah. So anyways, it's interesting to think like that. Another thing that I completely think I neglected to mention, and I'll bring it up in our critiques as we're looking at each other's work, is with the value keys. One of the greatest tools I use for that value key is saying, okay, you know, do you guys remember the four values of the landscape, the sky, the upright plains, the land, and the, the 45 degree angles or the hills? Yes. With each, within those, or within like the background versus the foreground, I will set up value keys. So within one painting, I can say everything that's further away than this is high key, you know, light, light values. Everything in the mid is mid values. And then in the front, I can use my full value spectrum, my full, all my values, highs, lows, mediums, or I can break it up into light and shadows so that they never cross, that my family stay separate. So within my light areas, things being affected by light, everything is in the high key, one to five, right? And then within my shadows, everything is in the low key. And if you 
if you're getting in trouble where things are getting mished, mashed up and kind of lost and you kind of don't know where values belong, by creating this separation for yourself. And what I'll even do, I'm going to skip, well, on my palette, I will even put my high, brighter value paintings or my bright, lighter value paint, uh, paints on one side and my shadow or darker key on the other and never the two shall meet. So even within my shadows, nothing is gonna be as light as the darkest thing in my lights. Hmm. And you'll get this beautiful separation where things completely read so much clearer. So I apologize, that was something I meant to get to when we were dealing with value keys. But that, and so hopefully we'll talk about that in the next class with colors and everything else, because that still works that way. And I'll hopefully figure out a little clearer way to discuss it. But I think it might be fun for one of our assignments to actually premix our colors and separate them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what I often will do is I have um, those little black to white uh, value charts uh, printed up or I've painted enough of them over the years just to have those out and say, okay, everything in my sky is one, you know, one being white, even though that's the opposite of the Munsell system, but that's how I think about it. One is white, 10 is black. Um, the Munsell system is the reverse of that. So it can get a little confusing, but let's just say white going towards black. Um, so my sky would be one, two, three. My ground planes is three, four, five. And then my uprights and my shadows, all the rest, right? And maybe I take away pure white and I take away pure black. So I'm working within that range. But that way I know too that my clouds, even in the shadowy dark under parts of clouds is not that dark. It will appear dark because it's surrounded by so much light, but it's not as dark as anything in the ground plane because it will just feel heavy and want to collapse. Right. And that's not saying we can have very, very dark clouds from time to time, but being aware of when that is and being honest with ourselves. Um, and then the same thing within the ground planes, within the flats areas is, OK, everything is within this value range, even including the shadows would be at the very bottom of that. But they're not as dark as anything, probably in the uprights. Because you so, still got light affecting from on top and stuff. Yeah. So, Michael, I've been trying to do your painting from last week um, in, in a high key. So I limited myself to gray acrylic um, as my darkest Great. and then white. And so just, just five values. Okay. Uh, wow. A five value range. Um, and um, so I'm trying to think of, of how that would work if you're trying I, I've struggled with exactly what you're talking about right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, as I was trying to do like the the flat areas, trying to not go to my grays, you know, my darkest dark. But I sometimes did because your range is so narrow. Yes, yeah, so you are definitely just by keeping it all within that range, the whole entire painting, it does become increasingly yeah. difficult. So you've, you've definitely lessened. And that was something I really, again, fought going back into the reference, the painting that we started last week, because I look at it and I'm like, oh man, the ground planes are too dark. The clouds are too dark for this rule that I'm telling you. But I'm, mm -hmm. um, but that photo was really interesting, of course, because I took it through sunglasses. So it's, you know, and it's polarized. So it's altering things. But in this instance, I'm not going for realism. I'm going mm. for mood and ambiance and ta-da, very, you know, very extreme, those dark, dark, dark sky. Like I said, it's so dark that you could poke a couple of little stars up there and, you know, um, but it's not really how it looked in real life. So if you're going towards the more poetic and the more artistic side, you can always push and pull these things. Um, let me see if I can okay. do a quick, I'm going to pin myself here. And let's see if I can do a screen share with this. You guys see uh, my, the, the grayscale here? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, so here is an idea with the sky being this. So solely, let's say that instead of 10, I have five, mm -hmm. right? So then I would just break it into littler pieces, probably. Um, or what I may suggest you do is introduce the foreground a little bit and bring up some of the about some of the darks a little bit in the areas closer and just open it up a little bit because I think with the image we chose it can be very interesting what you're okay. saying but it may not be a great um time to do that because of the extremity of the lights and darks I mean that's what the painting's kind of about that that uh, at least in my head okay. so um mm -hmm. You can definitely do it and I think it'll be interesting, but what you would do is you would just be condensing all of these, right? The sky would, instead of being two, two and a half uh, spots large, it would be just one, uh, the ground plane, one, the slanted planes, one, the upright planes, you know, the rest. Um, so anyways, I will share this. Um, I borrowed this from another painter whose name I cannot remember right now. I will look up her name so that, but this is not mine. I did not invent, or I did not create this slide. So just so you know, no credit to me, but it's, uh, what, when I was remembering it, I looked up some of the ideas about it and found this and found it to be very helpful. And this is just a rough guide, right? This is just for whatever painting she was discussing. But this is what I'm talking about, kind of that breaking it down the sky is her, you know, this is the Munsell system again, where 10 is white. And maybe we'll have to decide on a, do we want to talk that way? Um, no. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> um, ground plane, six and eight. And you can kind of, so look up at those values, right? And you can say, okay, yeah, that's a great sky values. Those are nice and airy. The light feels like it's coming from that. Then we get to the, this area here with the ground plane, right? And that's the area illuminated most by the sky. It's flat in comparison to the, you know, the sky. It gets the radiant light and the reflective light. Even if it's not being hit directly by the sunlight, the sunlight is bouncing off the dome of the sky and re, you know, reflecting back down onto the ground. So we have got a ground plane at the six to eight. Our slanted planes is like the hills or you know, bushes that are a little more, you know, rounded, whatever else is that getting darker quite a bit. You know, she even skipped the six to five area and then her uprights is uh, getting quite dark. One through mm. four. Um, it's funny if she would have done zero on this end and 10 over here, then, then her numbering would have lined up better, but uh, I get it. She's, She's a purist using, and I think she teaches using the Munsell color system as well. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more in color class, the different color theories and different ways of learning about color. Um, <clears throat> so does that make sense, you guys? I hate to kind of in, to yeah, introduce a new concept right on the last class here like that, but I really was beating myself up. Like, I can't believe I neglected to mention that the whole using of um, high key, low key, mid key, and full key uh, can be used in the different quadrants of the painting, either light and shadow family, or sky, ground plane, slanted plane, and upright planes. Um, yeah, but for the next class, you can figure out an exercise where we can we can practice this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I feel in a way like that would take away from that challenge of which, you know, uh, because then effectively you are using the whole range. Um, yeah, exactly. No, I would have still had you do that same challenge. I should have just maybe even had a fifth one or, you know, something like that, or the next week kind of saying that this is something I think about. Um, even in the, I know it's hard to see back there, the Cannon Beach picture that I'm working on. It's a very, oh, that doesn't work. Very foggy day out at Cannon Beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, there we go. Now I can see. 
So I split it in my values very um, simply. And I, all I've done is paint my backgrounds in the black, the trees that are kind of disappearing and stuff have been painted over with the oil paint, but I'll, I can see them enough that, you know, I'll be able to come back in and do all the darks. That's what'll be done next. And there'll also be a combination of warmer colors, even within the greens and the browns, there'll be warmer areas, but that's helping to split that up. It's helping to buy me some space. I like to joke that, you know, the more atmosphere and things I throw into paintings, things feel like they're getting pushed back further. And, uh, you know, basically when people buy my paintings, they're, they've bought more real estate. I've sold them more land for the same price. So, kind of nice. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, um, are you guys good with, let's just go ahead and start with feedback and critiques this week. Um, there's some beautiful work, and I did, wasn't able to get to a lot of it last week. Um, so let's see if I can pop us over to our Facebook page. And if anybody wants to last minute load a picture, feel free. Okay, everybody sees our beautiful Facebook group page here. I'm scrolling up. Yep. All right, once again, just as a quick reminder, all class videos are tucked right here underneath this picture. If you click it open and then go into the comments, all 11 of the videos that I've posted are in there. So you can go back through and review those. I'll leave those up um, indefinitely, but you know, see if Facebook, what happens when it becomes meta. <laughs> Uh, is, it, is that the same for all of the lessons we've had, even yeah. in the other classes? Yes, it is. Yep. I believe so. If you catch any that aren't, let me know. Um, yeah, I just basically said we are doing critique. Only one person saw it, unfortunately. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and pop over to our recent media section. Oh, somebody just loaded a painting in. That was me. Kathleen, way to sneak in at the last minute. All right. Nice. I got up at 5 a.m. to finish this today. <laughs> oh, man. Extra credit and a gold star for you. And you get to take a nap. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, really nice. Uh, it's pretty impressive for uh, waking and painting. That's not the easiest. Yeah. Okay. So... You get a gold star for two reasons. One, for effort. Two, look at what you just did back here. That is exactly what I was just talking about, right? Keeping the values. If you would like, go back in and lighten the sky considerably, you know, quite a bit more. Um, that'll open up your space a little bit. Um, not that you need to, but I'm just saying that. But look at these values, how they stay within that uh, lighter value key. And then as we come forward, it gets darker and darker. Very nice. If you wanted to, you know, even push your effects of atmosphere more, you could separate this hill, you know, I'd lighten the sky a little bit. That way you can lighten your hill a little bit yeah, and actually. then keep, the, keep those trees where they are. And then you could lighten this passage through here just a little bit more. Like there's a little bit more layer of atmosphere between us than that. You don't have to do any of this. I'm just saying how it would fit kind of into what I was just discussing. Okay, um, in my actual painting, my sky, right where the dip is, uh, to the left of that tree, right, yeah, that's almost pure white, and it gets lighter, I mean, it gets darker as it goes up, but perfect. I've used almost pure white right there. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, nice job, nice detail, nice design. Really, look at this, how it winds, that takes us in winds us up and then our eye just wants to come across. Very nice and then back up and then back up again. It was nice kind of continuous S curve. You've also got a nice heavy shape over here that kind of it's interesting enough, but we know to kind of stay within this area. Yeah, very nice, very interesting. Um, when we go in and glaze, if that's what you choose to do, again, you do not have to glaze your painting. You can go start painting on it. 
Blazing is just kind of a way to harmonize your background if you want. Um, that haystack rock painting I just showed you, there was no glazing in that. I just did this to get my st value structure and my design and then started painting. And, and the nice thing was, it's like having a really good drawing on there and I can paint over the top of the drawing in areas and not a problem. Um, when you glaze, if you glaze, just bear in mind, and this is gonna get me in trouble today with my painting from last week, is everything gets darker, no matter what. Even if you glaze in with yellow and it feels brighter, it's still value-wise a little bit darker. Any color added will darken. So um, that's something I'm trying to bear in mind is when I do these value paintings, I should probably lighten everything one or two levels. I've not been good about that yet, but if I know that I want to come in and glaze and you know paint over the top, I should probably up my values. And that's just me learning, experimenting as I go along. Um, so I probably couldn't even have told you that at the beginning of this class eight weeks ago. It's come about by trial and error and error and trial. <laughs> um, yeah, you want to tell us anything about this, Kathleen? What you got going on here? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I uh, I took three different photographs, and in I used to have two water features, and last night De Denise knows this because I sent her a picture, and she said, "I think that's a little confusing. Is that a bridge that you're?" your path is going over. And I thought, well, it probably would need one, but I was thinking of kind of a flooded plain. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so last night I just totally wiped out everything from the bottom third from that water all the way down. <clears throat> I totally painted over it, let it dry overnight. And then I got up this morning and put it in as dry land in the front and just left the one water feature on the on the right. So. It was a trial and error. <laughs> but isn't that nice that with these acrylics, we're able to do that. We're able to change our minds, come through. You know, it, it's like working in graphite, right? It's like working with a pencil with an eraser almost. And that's something I'm really enjoying is the exploration with the acrylic paint. Just literally, I wait two minutes and I can paint over the top of it, you know. They stay pretty opaque when I want them opaque. I can add a little bit of water to make them a little more transparent or scrub them a little bit further or do like you're doing and putting in kind of the brushy texture to let some of the air through. Um, very nice. Uh, as I'm scrolling my eye back, I might take out this tree here and let a little more of that water kind of come across. These are becoming pretty repetitive as okay. if they were planted there, kind of like a hedgerow of, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the bush. I killed two of them this year. Um, anyways, <laughs> those roundy uh, shrubs that are so nice and hardy, except for when it gets to 115 degrees, evidently. Um, Talking about <clears throat> Arvabite? Uh, I don't believe so. I, okay, evergreens yeah, or not? I have those too, but those are going, doing fine. Um, anyways, I would maybe just allow a little bit more of this water to come across. It also becomes repetitive, not only with the trees, but that one, two, three, and they're all triangles. Okay. Um, and that's just, that is so me nitpicking. I always feel bad when I uh, come in and critique a painting that's doing so well, but um, quite nice, quite beautiful. I think you heard the... Uh, oohs and ahs when you when we turned it on even though it's on everybody's on mute so that's impressive can i say something about it kathleen can she say something about it of course so one thing i just love also is how how you that i struggle with is how your foreground grasses are um just broken up and they just look more natural and uh and that just looks really nice well, that's something I've struggled with, too. I tend to paint every blade. And in, <laughs> in our last uh, conversation uh, critique with Michael, I emailed him and he was so kind to allow me to talk to him on the phone. 
And that's what he said is you don't have to paint every blade. And I didn't really know how to paint grasses any other way. And so I started studying his paintings and realized that by using the shop brush, you know, I didn't have to paint every blade. I was using a small brush and just painting every blade. So it was a learning thing. And, and if I've accomplished it, I'm so happy. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's another one of your black and whites where I'm like, oh man, I'm hesitant to have you paint over it. It's so nice. Um, yeah, anyways, and yeah, good job on the grasses for sure. And I, I will, go, I'm going to go ahead and share what I said to you, even though it's rude a little bit, but it's for everybody. Um, when I'm in coffee shops or in, you know, OSA gallery and seeing, you know, all the students work and everything, one of the biggest giveaways of an amateur painter or a beginning painter is the, looking at the grass or the leaves. And this is going to ruin your looking at paintings from now on. So I apologize. But what I see happen so very often is they make a nice grass stroke and that's, oh, that's a grass. All I need is 2 million more of those and I've got a lawn, grass, 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 grass. And it's, they're no longer thinking, looking at shapes and values. They're just thinking this stroke equals grass and there's 1 million grasses, 1 million strokes. And it's even more evident in leaves when they put down a dot and all of a sudden, okay, that's a leaf. I just need, you know, hundreds more dot, 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 dot. And they, you know, maybe they're like, oh, I'm painting an impressionist painting. But in fact, what they're doing is creating a stamp tool. Okay. You're not thinking anymore. You're not thinking shapes, values, colors. You're thinking things. You're thinking leaf, 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 grass, 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 grass. Same thing can happen in clouds where they'll use their big, soft, round brush and poke. You know, five of these pokes equals a nice, fluffy cloud. And, you know, all of a sudden you've got a cloud stamp, a leaf stamp, and a grass stamp, and off you go. And it's just not how nature presents itself. And it's not how I think we as painters should present nature. We should look shapes, values, colors, and then edges, you know, the difference in edges. And you've got a very great examples of that. You got some nice firm edges, some very soft edges, lost edges, you know, mid edges. Um, we've done exercises uh, about that last spring, if you were in my classes, about dealing with hard edge, soft edge, lost edge, found edge, um, and everything else. And this painting has all of that. So not only do you have value shifts going from the darks back to the lighter, you've also got edge quality shifts um, and all of this. So, so much nice uh, variety, variety is the word I'm looking for. So much nice variety of values and edges and brush strokes in this painting that it never gets boring. Right. And what the funny thing is, is when, you know, when I first started looking at impressionist paintings in college, when I was kind of first introduced to them in a serious way, I wasn't very impressed by them. I often thought, well, they just kind of look like unfinished paintings. They look like the beginnings of paintings. And I felt like the brush strokes were quite repetitive. <clears throat> but then as you begin to learn more or you begin to look at the better ones like Monet, um, you realize how much variety and brush strokes and edges and all the different things uh, he's doing or they were doing. Mary Cassatt, another great uh, example. She, I just love her work. We actually have a couple of her prints throughout our house. Um, and uh, so once you start to do it, you're gonna start to see it in more paintings. So anyways, nice job. In Enjoy your gold star and your nap. <laughs> All right, Lisa, I saw you here. Yep, there you are. Hi, Lisa. Lisa. Um, this painting is so Monet in color and treatment in a way. Um, it's interesting seeing it a little bigger. I just seen it as a thumbnail earlier. But there is this is such a beautiful example of the high key painting. I'm hoping that's kind of what you were after a little bit there. 
Yes, I was, I was trying to do a, a narrow range, which has been very hard for me through the whole class. I always want to put in more contrast. It so, is hard, yeah. Do not. And I, so I just uh, tried to keep it very narrow. Yeah, and it's, it's such a, I don't want to say simple, because it's not, but it, it's a simple scene, right? It's just a ground plane, oh, yeah. grasses, maybe it looks kind of like sand dunes almost. And then I'm guessing that these are, you know, clouds coming across. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely am, I'm going to praise you for a second and then I'm going to come back in and uh, crush you a little bit here in just a second. So prep for that. But all right, I'm ready for the crush. OK, good. Beautiful colors. This area up on top. I just love I mean, I, truthfully, if we just zoomed in on this top portion up here. Right up in here. Yeah. And I, oh, yeah. put Monet at the bottom of it, I would believe that this was a portion of a Monet painting. The texture, the loose brushwork, um, it's really nice. This is wonderful. The cools and warms and the great the transition in between from you know a warm yellow to a warmish peachy color, but it getting cooler and then into these kind of more mauve colors. And then look at these, this peach area up here compared to this peach area as it continues to cool down and gray down. And as we zoom out, watch what happens to it is our eye just skims right across it so naturally. So nice, beautiful, the top third of it, lovely. These clouds are nice and interesting. You got a good variety of brush strokes. In my head, I'm going to pretend that you were working from top down and then began to possibly <laughs> rush it a little bit because um, I'm not actually a few shortcuts. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm not exactly sure. I'm guessing this is a cloud, the sky. And then I believe that these are both clouds as well. But let's hear from you. Are these clouds? Uh, I don't, can't see where your cursor are. No, it's, it should be water in the mid in the mid ground. So this is water, and then these are trees on top of hills back here. Yes. Okay, so that's where it begins to fall apart for me. I actually thought that this white on the bottom was still sky, and that this ground is down here, and that these were just strange clouds. With Oh, that's interesting. It's because of the values being, and the colors being exactly the same pretty much as these clouds. And they're almost even cloud-shaped minus the... Um, Let's ask really quick. Did you guys see this as water with a hillside behind it and trees on top, or do you see these as floating a little more? So I I see the the things in at the top from the middle up. I see those as mountains. I don't see them as clouds. Okay, great. I saw them as bits of land in the water with grass growing on them. That's what I saw. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, water as well. <laughs> hey, all right. So I'm so the odd what, one what, out here. I will. I will. What, take what medium is this? Uh, this is. is this? Uh, well, I, I took. Um, it's really very simple. It's burnt sienna and ultramarine. It's a water-based oil. Ah, right, right. It has an interesting look. It, it, it. I like those little sort of dry bits on it. Yeah, it gets and the, a and the, It has a different texture than oil when it's dry. Yeah, and then you get you get more of a um, scumbly look. Yes. Yeah. Scratchier feeling, yeah. Okay, well, good. See, then you did it. I, I was the only one that wasn't quite reading it uh, correctly. Um, well, I, I, Michael, in your defense, I mean, it, it, it's kind of ambiguous because those land masses have sort of curved bottoms. And I think one, one thing you know, for next time would be to remember that when the when the land hits the water, the water is very, very, very flat. Yes. Yeah, yes, you're right. Thank you. And I think I saw this separation between as being like where it, I'm not sure where the water is the water go all the way to this cloud. No. OK, just to hear kind of a thing. Again, I'm sorry, it's hard to see my cursor, but at the bottom of the landforms there, the background lands. The sky is just above the sky. It's just at the top. <laughs> oh, okay. There's no sky in the middle. Okay. So anyways, a little bit confusing for me there. Everybody else got it. Um, and it is tough with these limited uh, values, right? To create 
you know, that sense of depth. So that's kind of a note for ourselves as, you know, where are the limitations? Where would maybe it be more useful to bring in, you know, one or two more values or possibly lighten another area so that these values can do more work. Um, if everything's yeah. kind of in the mid range, like if I turn this into a black and white, you don't have any real light lights. Everything's, you know, there's no white in here. I mean, this area is pretty light and the cloud appears pretty light. Um, yeah, but it's an interesting color combination too with the browns, the white and the white. Um, this may be a little bit of an example of what I was talking about uh, previously with Kate's painting um, uh, is that this does feel a little bit repetitive in your grass strokes here, you know, uh, just a touch. And then the fact that these strokes also mimic your, is the, are these grasses on top of the ground or are those hill, trees way back there in your world? Yeah, well, there should be trees in the background, but as I, when I look at them uh, as the picture shows, it's um, they certainly could use some variety in both value change and shape. Yeah, because they're just painted the exact same stroke almost as the grasses. So um, a little clarification there. Okay. Yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting one. I think it's on its way. I think it's worth revisiting this painting and maybe, you know, fixing up a couple areas and maybe introducing um, a little more value shift in it just because I think it, it can handle it um, and maybe use it. But uh, anyways, there's a lot of really nice stuff going on in there. Uh, really interesting. And uh, I really appreciate your sharing that with us. And again, okay, thank you. Top of the sky is just... Uh, just beautiful. Thanks. No problem. Laura. Mm. All right. Look at those nice flowy grasses as they kind of work us back to our focal point, kind of right in here, brings us back in here. And then we kind of zip along up here. So it does have this kind of interesting implied S curve in the painting, which is a design element where we'll, we can talk about uh, a little more. Um, the different types of design. Maybe I will spend one of our color classes kind of breaking up, um, breaking down a couple of the major design ideas. Um, we'll be kind of using um, Edgar Payne's book, uh, Landscape Design, and talking about that. And I will share some of his uh, templates. Um, but I don't know if that was intended at all. It could also be, there's another kind of design called what is it, radiant design? So if we say this is the focus here, kind of in the center a little bit, watch the lines kind of radiate out from there, almost like a, if you can kind of imagine sun rays, which is funny because there are sun rays, but if, <laughs> that, like if you put a cloud kind of coming this way, it would continue on. A lot of artists use that. I use that a lot when I'm painting vineyards and different things like that. It's kind of a radiating, design so it just kind of brings you in towards it so you got kind of both the s-curve that um if we took the bottom off we also could have a steel yard design where you have a, one heavy big shape on one side opening up to the other side and again we'll talk about all those but those are that's just a little teaser the um the reference photo is the next photo if you're interested beautiful beautiful that's it and really fun to see once you bring in some colors and what, re what really I want to try and get is that, you know, that radiant sun that's not really shown as much as you just see the, the sunlight coming out. Yeah, and kind of haloing well, some of these things. Yeah, the halo. So we'll see. I'm looking forward to your demo. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you got going on here. We'll stay on this for a second as you tell us where, kind of what, and then we'll go back to your painting. Well, about this, about the photo? Yeah, yeah, just give us a little background on it or what you what what attracted you to it and why did you kind of keep um, your focus in the middle and different things like that? Well, the other thing that I really like about this photo is the entire foreground, although it seems like a very light and very detailed um, field, is actually, if you squint, it's quite neutral and quite dark. And I hope to capture that as well. So as I put the colors on, I will probably be glazing the foreground field down into sort of a, 
a neutral, slightly, possibly darker than it reads in the black and white. Great. And that is such a good observation. And this is such a great example of what I was talking about, too. Whereas, you know, sometimes I deal with my values in recession of space, you know, my lightest values far back and, you know, coming forward, this wouldn't be that case, right? Not really, because our darkest darks are almost kind of in this line of trees mm -hmm. over here. If you want, you know, of course the camera is darkening these. I may lighten and cool these slightly so that these darks come forward more. Um, yeah, that was that was puzzling to me because, you know, I always expect in a landscape, the further away it is, the lighter that line of trees will be. And yet in the photo, the further line of trees is definitely darker than the foreground one, which I take to be a reflection of the, the meadow bouncing up on the foreground trees. Um, but I don't know. Is, is it, does it read the sun? So, well, and the other thing is maybe the sun is actually far enough behind that far line of trees on the left, which is why it completely reads almost completely in silhouette. I don't know. It, I don't know how that's going to work out because okay. when I did it, the black and white, it seems so dark. Yeah. I've got a couple things for you here. When we're dealing with the colors within the shadows and things like that, it does, of course, have to do with the object. These trees are innately darker colored trees, mm. right? Those are, you know, dark green pine trees for the most part. They're dense. There's more, they're denser than these. There's more light getting through. Um, and these are lighter colored trees and shrubs, right? Just the leaves on them themselves are a lighter colored. So a lot of the guidelines and rules I give for like breaking it down into four values, you know, the uprights and stuff. That's just the starting point. And then you begin to go in. And then the second thing I wanted to point out is that this is a photo. The camera is trying to figure out where you're <laughs> looking and what you want, what, what's the key. And because you have, if, if the sky were bleached out and this light area was bleached out, then we'd have a lot more information back here. When I take a photo of something that I'm really, oh man, that's so beautiful. I really want to paint that and I'm pretty positive I'm going to paint it. I will take three photos with my camera. One, I will touch the sky and it'll appear kind of like you have with all the information in the lightest lights. Then I will touch into the mid on my next photo. And that will kind of get an overall feeling of the painting. And then on the third one, I will touch into the darks, the shadows. And what that will do will bleach out your sky and your probably your highlights will become kind of, you'll lose a lot of the information there, but you'll get the information in your shadows. So then when I go back to paint, I can look at all three photos and pull out, like maybe it's nice that it's just a solid dark form and you know simplified and everything else. Or maybe I do want to see, you know, in there a little more. Um, but that's something I do a lot, especially when like, okay, let's say I'm photographing Haystack Rock, but, you know, not like the scene I just showed you. I'm down on the beach, it's sunset, and I don't want the rock to just appear to be one giant dark mass because I know that there's crags and there's grasses on top. And of course, I want to be able to see the puffins and, uh, you know, all that information. But the sunset is so beautiful and the painting is mostly about the sunset, you know, then I would do, you know, two or three photos and combine them either physically or just mentally just laying them out. And so that I, you know, when I get home, I have the information of Haystack Rock as well as the sky. Um, so there's your three possible reasons for it to be darker is it's denser. It, that, you know, that totally answers your, my question. Just the first thing you said is this is the camera trying to balance it out. I completely forgotten about that. That probably what I want to do is lighten up that rear line of trees. Right. And if you cool it down, then you also like, if you bring in some purples and, you know, purpley grays and stuff into there, right. it'll play off these warms so nicely. It'll still read very dark, but it won't feel like this really heavy left side. You can keep it quite dark. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of painters, Amanda Houston, uh, pastelist, I took a work, well, I assisted her at a workshop 
recently. I never realized, but she actually puts darks um, oftentimes into some of her further away objects and you just don't even notice it. It's kind of funny, but she was actually mm. the one that pointed it out to me. She's like, you always make everything feel like it's really receding into space. And she doesn't worry about that um, too much. So it's just a matter of, you know, your personal style, what you're after. And a lot of times having some darks in different areas, even though I wouldn't do it, or I, I wouldn't even think it, like my instinct would be to automatically come and enlighten those so that these shadows on the right sides could be darker and appear to come forward. Whoa. And conversely, look at this nice darks down here so I could play those up. Interestingly, compositionally, I think having that distant line of trees dark is nice. Yeah. Because absolutely. it balances out that big sort of medium foreground mass, but um, but it, I, it but I don't think it reads as distant as much as it could if it were lightened up. Okay, but the great thing about distance and perspective is that that is just one tool we have, right? So to create the idea of distance or depth in, or perspective in our paintings, we have value shifts, right? That's what I've been talking about, right? And you can see the hills way back there. They're quite light. Um, we have value shifts. That's just one of our tools. You do not have to use all of your tools. What do we also right. have? We have things as they go up towards the horizon line, right? The lower things are compared to the horizon line, the closer they appear. The higher things are up above the horizon line, the closer they appear. A lot of times you can make your clouds feel like they're going back in space by having some big clouds up here and littler clouds back here. These ones will feel closer. Um, you have overlapping of forms, okay? So these trees, because they're lower compared to the horizon line, are and are overlapping these trees, that automatically creates a sense of depth and distance. Our third tool is diminishing size. As things recede, and these are obvious, but it's I think it's good to hear. As things go back, they'll often get smaller. You know, if you had a giant pine tree here, it might kind of hurt that illusion a little bit, but these trees being so much bigger than these also create the illusion of depth and space, okay? So you have a lot of tools here that tell us how things are lying, laying, lying, in perspective and in space. So you don't need to use all of them. So if values aren't working, oh, and you also have edges generally crisper edges look at these fine little details up here and then as we look back at these grasses we're not really seeing individual grasses very much they're just massed up here we can see you know the individual leaves more and even as we get from here to here the leaves begin to blur and blend blend until all we're seeing is big shapes and not individual leaves right so you have um detail receding back into space, less detail as you go back. You've got oh. values, which um, this one doesn't work with as little bit. Overlapping, size diminishing, right? Look how big these grasses are. These grasses in the foreground are bigger than these trees almost, right? These trees are much bigger than these trees. And then you've got a tiny, tiny hill. So you've got diminishing uh, size. Um, and then edge quality that you can work with just by softening these edges and taking out some of the detail, these fall back. So you do so mm -hmm. many tools to help you tell the story of depth and perspective. That value is just one, right? Right. So when one tool isn't working for you, look to the other tools. And maybe you play them up a little bit or whatever else. Um, so very nice. So there, let's go back to this. Zoom out. Very nice. Um, I am learning that, you know, when I'm doing these, that if I keep my skies, again, even a step brighter than this, because if you come in and glaze, the, this will darken again, especially if you come in and glaze with dark, you know, a blue, which is a darker color than the yellow. Right. This will get quite dark. That's okay, right? Because we're not only dealing with glazing. 
We can also, the glazing is just one of the tools again. We can also come in and, you know, use our opaque paint and put in whatever color on top is, and that's what I'm gonna have to do today because I, um, you just, it's amazing how much darker acrylic paints get as they dry. Good point. And also when you glaze, things get darker. So um, just a reminder. So anyways, beautiful. I love the expressive brush strokes that, you know, you did go ahead and find kind of the um, nice shapes and everything else. My only thing would possibly be that this is really quite centered. You know, maybe I would have cut off over here mm -hmm. or, or, you know, something like that, but I don't think it's going to bother us. But if I put my fingers up, um, can't see me. I don't know if you guys can see me little, but if I put my fingers up and measure the screen, it's it's pretty centered where your sun, where the trees end. Um, but anyways, that's okay. Well, that might be mitigated, but once I get the um, the really glowing grass on the left hand side, it's going to look like something on the left rather than something centered. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> that is my hope. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have anything to add here to Laura's painting or what I just discussed? Did that make sense to everybody about perspective and about how we have all these tools we get to use? It's funny. There's so much to talk about in painting. Like, I don't think I even brought up all of those different tools really during this class, these eight weeks. I like the sky holes in the tops of the trees. Yeah, thank you. Laura is so good about sky holes. Sky holes are us. Yeah, yeah, not afraid of them. All right, Laura, another one. This is a nice and simplistic one for you. This normally has so much detail and information, but I almost see this as kind of like a a sketch and kind of working out ideas. And it's kind of fun for me to see this because I'm like, oh, okay, what can I use? You know what? I'm because I'm going to be doing something similar to. Course. Let's hear about what, what you thought on this one. My the whole point of this exercise was to see if I could get that velvety green in the foreground. And I really just took your photo and, and took out every bit of detail and um, just tried to put in sky and horizon and foreground. And and uh, you know, I don't know. Now that I think about it, the green doesn't look so bad. Um, when I did it, I thought that's not right. But, of course, as I say, things always look better on the little screen. <laughs> Don't they? Um, nice job. I like the fact that you simplified it. You made it very much more obviously a sky painting, right? None of us would doubt that you have just enough information down here to present uh, kind of background information, kind of saying it's here, it's on these rolling hills, kind of farm-like, um, you know, and it's interesting, but we're up here. This painting is about the top two thirds of the painting. This is a sky painting. And from what you just said a few minutes ago, I realized, yeah, that uh, that cloud on the upper left, that's a bit dark. It is, but you're basing it on the reference. And it, like I said, we're using our artistic license. We're going to push and you can go back in and lighten that if you want. Um, I'll be curious what I end up doing with it as I'm painting. Um, but by setting up our design and our values, now I can begin to paint. And, you know, it's not like we're stuck with this. Like you can come back with opaque paint. You don't have to just stick with your glaze. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, lighten underneath some of these clouds or even introduce some other clouds or brighten up, you know, make literally a visible sun almost, you can. You could uh, change the color gradients so the trees closest to the sun are, you know, warmer and then they get cooler as they you know get further away you can come back in with some opaque paint and put some more texture in the foreground if you wanted to you don't need to um you know this is it's really quite nice as it is um but just because we've done a, an acrylic painting and then glazed into it does not mean your painting is done um <laughs> it, it can be if you like it and you want it darn to yeah, sorry. Um, but it can yeah, be. But it's also, it's small. I'm not sure about, you know, hammering it with too much detail. It's only, I think it's nine by 12. <laughs> yep, that's your call completely. I'm just saying that, you know, opaque paint, you know, I often think of once I've got my design, my values established, 
and then I've got my glaze in. Now I'm kind of halfway done. Right. I get it. But it can be done. There's times when I do just the black and white and I'm like, oh my God, I should leave this alone. It's so nice as it is. I never do because I can't leave good enough alone. But, you know, <laughs> how do I know when I'm done? When I've ruined it. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> when I've learned all my lessons the hard way. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, anyways, nicely done. It's fun to see this because it's kind of a little bit of a preview of what I'm in for and uh, what I can do. And um, very nice. Beautiful. Anybody have anything to add to say? So I just want to comment that I think the black cloud up on the left actually provides a, a interesting tension in the in the painting. Um, you know, there's this softness of this sunset, I think, um, and then this kind of oh, are we about to have a big change in weather? Huh. Anyway, huh. I, I kind of I kind of like it to tell you the truth. So okay. Right, and it is, again, it's got that kind of poeticness to it by bringing in elements that maybe we wouldn't see with our, you know, our eyes normally. But again, you guys get to push and pull and everything is just guidelines for your expression. They're just tools. If you, you know, one of us may make this a very happy, pretty, scene and the next one of us may make it a you know uh oh here comes you know a disaster um or heaviness um you guys remember the book good night moon mm -hmm. i always when as i've been working on this painting and looking at it i keep wanting to name this good night farm <laughs> i don't know why. i don't know why i even said that all right here's your sketch yeah look so you did it in a pretty mid value range. You don't really have dark darks unless the camera's, you know, lightning things. Um, but you can really see how much darker things got <laughs> once you started glazing into it. I mean, did you darken yeah. up above or is that just a dark glaze over? That's that's just the layers of glaze, yeah. So isn't that interesting? Um, okay, Sully, look at yours. Wow. All right, we got some busy painters. Nice. Is this on a panel or paper, or what did you paint this on? It's on a uh, canvas sheet. Okay. Uh, tape, tape to a. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, this is a a uh, a, a gesso uh, canvas panel. Okay, great. That very nice. And I, I go ahead. No, I I bought it gesso. I didn't do anything further. <laughs> Great, nicely done. You know, it's it's still retaining kind of its sketchy kind of underpainting feel. So, you know, you can paint in as much detail or as information as you want. You know, you've got more information in the foreground, but up in the skies where I'm kind of looking, I'm like, okay, she's just kind of painting in the ideas and some marks for here. So I think when you come in and glaze, you're gonna probably want to actually paint in some of your clouds and sky to, uh, clean that up i think it'll look pretty interesting when you glaze maybe if you could once you if you do glaze depending on how you approach this painting solely um maybe mm -hmm. you could take a photo of the mid like once you glaze it and then maybe when you kind of get closer to finishing it just so we can see that because i'd be curious about what that mm -hmm. might do um yeah, and you did like I did. You kept this line pretty dark. The base of this is pretty dark. And so it's, you know, it, it does the effects of using darks to lights as we recede into space. Um, I did the exact same thing. So I'm going to have to play that up, possibly changing, like these darks could be a little warmer and these darks, you know, away from the sun may appear a little bit cooler, you know, over in here, blues, purples, if I want. I may just do it as a very monochromatic painting. I am not sure, um, but we do have that opportunity to use temperature shifts to uh, differentiate um, some of our values as well. And that sounded a little mm -hmm. bit confusing. Um, no, that's also, helpful. 
as you um, get in and start painting, I would probably obliterate some of the road so it's not so clear. Our eyes, don't worry, the viewer will fill in. So don't be afraid to lose a little bit of some of these edges so that, you know, these crisper edges up close read. Um, mm. As a sketch, as a note to yourself, this is totally fine. Again, I think I have the exact same thing in my painting. Mm -hmm. But just to be aware that trust the viewer, the viewer will find their way. Mm -hmm. So uh, softening some of that. You, um, it's interesting when we figure out what do we tell the viewer? What do we hint to the viewer? And what do we let the viewer figure out? Um, when I uh, forget these rules, I often will look to um, John Singer Sargent's paintings, and I will look to Rembrandt's paintings. Rembrandt was the king of, you know, having figures walking in and out of shadows or, you know, kind of peering out of shadows. Or, you know, it, it's so interesting because you think of Rembrandt's as so beautifully rendered and there's whole areas where things are not described that much, but be, our brain just fills in the information. Um, and again, Sargent does the same thing. I bring up the uh, painting Lil Carnation, Lily, Lily Rose a lot. I actually bought a big print of it because I found myself studying it. It's one of my favorite paintings. That's the one of the two young girls in the white dress holding up the Japanese lanterns in the garden. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful story of how he painted that just a couple minutes every night. Um, these poor girls had to keep trudging out. In fact, he even had to change out one of the girls because it was taking so long. And, um, and then people were coming out just to watch him paint for a little bit each evening. It became an, an event. You know, he was just trying to capture the light. But the thing that I like about the painting, besides the fun story, is his use of detail and his lack of detail, where you know, when I think about the painting, I can picture all these flowers and these beautiful detail in the flowers. But when you look at it, he just describes some of them and then hints at the rest and our eyes fill in that detail. So I think about that a lot when I'm painting leaves or grasses. And I just have to tell the viewer a little bit. I just have to give them enough information to say, over here is a tree. These are some leaves. Over here's, you know, the grasses, whatever. And let the viewer do the work. Um, it may, that's a personal thing, right? I like paintings that say the most with the least. I like being a part of the painting. And I think when you allow me to use my brain and fill in the story and some of the information, you give me enough, like it's like a mystery, right? And our brain fills in the rest. Um, I feel like I am part of the painting. Mm -hmm. So just... Not, not saying any of that's happening in your painting here because this is the underpainting in the sketch. But very nice. Anybody have anything to add here at all? All right, let's keep moving along. Woo, that's dark. This, were you sad this day, Laura? No, nope, you're on mute. This was one of the uh, four, on a, four on a panel exercise of the value. Uh -huh. So um, this one, I'm not really happy with the way it came out, but I didn't spend too much time on it. So. Sure. It was just, it was just an exercise. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And a great, great example of things get even darker when we glaze into them. <laughs> um, again, we're, all, we're all learning together, right? You know, between the 10 of us or however many there are sharing our work. Yeah. Um, we all, I'm all not sure I'm, each other as not well. sure I'm gonna go with the, with the fuchsia next time. Yeah, it's interesting. Nice shapes, nice design. I'm going to go ahead and skim right through it as we kind of get. So this would be your, is this your full value? This is the full one. This one I'm happy with. I like, I like the way this came out. It's so interesting, too, how you present sky holes and these shapes. It just always reminds me, like, I could literally see this as a stained glass window on, like, a beautiful home or church. Um, they really have this kind of stained glass appearance. You guys want to hear something crazy I'm going to experiment with? I actually bought pulverized glass that I'm thinking of mixing into some of my whites and lights to hmm. see what happens as light goes through it and, you know, bounces around within it. So mixing those, that pulverized, uh, pulverized glass into some of my paints. So Hold on, and I'll let you know how that goes. If I next time you see me, my hands are all cut up real bad. You'll oh. know. 
not a good I don't know, my my first thought is wear a mask <laughs> yeah exactly it, it is it's really fine i would definitely want to wear a mask um, will, will you have to use some kind of glue or will the oils hold it enough um supposedly it's fine enough that i can mix it in with the glue or yeah in with the paint and it should hold i will definitely be experimenting with it on throwable weighable paintings um it's kind of a glass that's um i can't remember what but they, they use it on fingernail polish mixing it in with fingernail polish so there shouldn't mm. even be a texture to it it just um in looking at the pictures of the fingernail polish and i'd never seen any artists use it but it created this kind of translucent um effect where the light was able to travel through the paint a little bit and so i was just like ah that's worth you know nine dollars for the jar to experiment mm -hmm. with and maybe I shouldn't have told you, maybe that should have been my secret formula. <laughs> That's right. Nobody so, can replicate. Ask you all to forget what I just said. Thank you. All right. High key. This one's so obvious. And this really has a nice feel to it as well. I'm going to keep going, but yeah, nicely done. These are great examples of the exercises and you're low key. No, not mm -hmm. low key, mid key. Mid key. Right. Yeah, which looks yeah. very low key. <laughs> See, yeah, that the darks got even darker, and that's yeah. due to the glazing. We're learning, um, and you can always come back in and lighten things up. If right, you exactly. And uh, are you on here with us? Sorry, I can't see how many people are with us today. I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about Chanda's work, hoping that she uh, sees the replay. Um, so I like what you've done here, Chanda, of mixing, it looks like a number of different uh, photos and combining, and you can see it can be really quite basic, because all we need, again, is notes for ourselves. We don't know, none of your end viewers, your in patrons, your gallery, the, nobody needs to see these, how the uh, sausage was made, right? We just, uh, all, they're just notes and information for herself. I like that Chanda thought that, you know what, this could use something in the foreground. This could use some more information, something to help us read space. And uh, yeah, very nice, good ideas. All right, and then her painting. Um, it's got a pretty nice feeling of depth and light. I would probably darken these grasses or maybe even more realistically I would probably lighten some of the sky because right now the lightest lights are in the foreground grasses um, as opposed to the thing that's actually illuminating them the sky back here so I would probably lighten that up probably darken this just a touch um, the idea of the tree was so nice but I think that this is too kind of boring, if I can be as rude to say it like that. It's just kind of a very simple shape. It serves its purpose as saying, we've got this tree here in the foreground, but I think this is an opportunity to invest some interesting shapes and maybe make this a little more special. Right now it just says tree. But when I look at the reference, you know, maybe this is a little too crazy, but this has definitely got some nice shapes to it. It's a lot, much more exciting with these angles. So, and it looks like you even, Chanda, even went through and edited and made these shapes more interesting, which I like, and I often will do myself, and then kind of forgot. Or maybe you just had to keep fixing your shapes until all of a sudden you get a big bushy tree there. Um, <laughs> since you're not here, um, maybe you can let us know in the notes after you watch the video. Um, I think, yeah, you have a lot of good ideas. That little creeping of light above the hills is really quite interesting and could be really dramatic. Um, the road starts off with a nice feeling of depth and perspective, but getting wide after it gets narrow here um, hurts it a little bit. I understand when they curve in that, you know, on the turns, it'll appear a little wider, but just kind of observe this. Um, that's another thing I'm going to have to fix on my very own painting is um, I know you guys pointed out that my road looked a little weird. I thought I fixed it, but it's still a little bit off. Roads in perspective are not as simple as they look. 
a lot of times um, looking at just the shape of the road or looking at where does this curve line up with this curve and coming across, looking how it flattens out. Um, yeah, you did that really nice. And it, what all it does here is it appears we're going down a hill a little bit and back up a hill and then it flattens out over here. So it, it makes our ground feel like it's not so flat. You guys see that a little bit, how it feels like we're going down, back up right here a little bit and then turning. Um, and if you want that, that's fine. That's great. Um, but just kind of being aware that happens oftentimes with when we paint creeks, uh, same thing, of course, could happen with trails or whatever our guiding our thing guiding us in. So I think by simply making this curve coming out a little more would probably fix that up. All right. Anybody want to add? Also, anything there? Yeah, I want to add that. Um... You know, comparing this to your black and white, one of the things that you do is you make your brush strokes on the road horizontal, except for the middle fuzzy part and, you know, the uh, part where the um, weeds are. Um, Unfortunately, and, Laura, I, I lost you for just a second. Can you say it again? What about the brush strokes? The brush strokes are horizontal where you paint them. You tend to extent, you accentuate the, the horizontal plane. And um, whereas in pictures where the brush strokes go along the surface of the road, you know, sort of go in the direction of the road, it, it, it doesn't ground it as well, it seems. And if the brush strokes in, in that road strip were horizontal rather than sort of following the contour of the road, um, it, might, it might anchor it more to the to the ground. ground. Yes, well, yeah. said, well said. Um, yeah, and that's, that is um, when we kind of learn to use our brush strokes to kind of give the form of the object, I think, you know, and that's a little bit advanced. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm painting, let's say an apple sitting on a table, the front side of the apple facing me, I may paint a little more horizontally, like kind of flat across or vertically up and down. And then as the apple kind of wraps around on each side, I may change the angle of the brush stroke a little bit to, you know, being a little more diagonal. Same thing on my tree trunks, um, on the trees themselves. You can use the brush strokes to kind of hint at the form. Um, if you, you know, you can see it a little bit in the hills back here. It's really probably hard for you guys on your monitors, but um, there's some form being hinted at and then the clouds of course the form is being hinted at so lots of good stuff yeah the foreground grasses it may not be complete too these may just kind of be notes of they're a little lighter on the edges of the road um anyways nicely done lots of good ideas if you have any questions shonda please just uh, either write in the comment or i will uh yeah michelle you are brave I have not even been brave enough to attempt these uh, photos I've taken on it. These are like literally on, my, I've been on the cusp of painting this series a number of times. So my hat's off to you, brave or stupid, we get to, you'll get to decide. Um, but it is, I just love the, uh, the colors. These reds are just for me to die for. There's some of my favorite colors, those umbers. Um, so uh, nice brave choice let's see how it goes oh man nice start nice nice work i see where you're kind of changing things up and opening things up you've taken a slightly more aerial view so we can see the water so it's like you're standing up on your tiptoes or on a little bit of a something right because all of a sudden we're standing taller do you guys see that mm -hmm. oops now we're standing up. It's like you're literally sitting down here looking at the scene and then you stand up to go refill your coffee. And oh, I actually like being able to see a little water back here. That's nice. Um, that opens it up a little bit. And uh, so nice job there. Um, you've taken these trees out, which is probably a good idea. And uh, when um see these darks over here 
they're really quite out of place. They are um, hurting my uh, idea of space and depth here. Go ahead, Michelle. Back and forth and not getting the results I wanted on things. So I just have to let it set up a little bit. And then I plan on putting some more atmosphere in there. Okay, great. So which, which darks, Michael, when you- These trees indicate. back here. Ah, I see. See how those darks are wanting to connect with these darks? If you just kind of cover the rest of this- uh, Well, you're absolutely right. I thought they were the same trees, but no, you're right. I believe they're kind of on the same, all on this kind of same plane, at least as these kind of trees. And admittedly, like the light is behind these trees, Oops, I keep forgetting which way to go. But look how light they are here. They're cooler, but their value is really light. And it's kind of nice. You have these dark shrubs kind of sticking up here to kind of counter off of and to read it. Um, not a huge thing. And like you said, Michelle, you can come back in. And sometimes we just kind of go, you know what? It's not working. I'm just going to make a quick note to myself, get this information down, and then I'll come back in. Um, I can, I have nothing but praise for your bottom two thirds. I think it's just really quite beautiful. Just enough detail. It's not overbearing. Uh, when I was looking at the uh, little thumbnails of it, as I was strolling uh, through yesterday afternoon or evening, I actually had a hard time telling which one was the photo and which one was the painting on, mm -hmm. first, on first glance. I actually thought maybe it was either two, two photos or two paintings. Um, so you're getting a lot of it. You really are. It takes, you know, uh, some staring at and some analyzing to start to go, okay, well, this part over here is not quite as successful as it could be. You know, maybe some kind of a contrast over here to play up or something. I don't know if you're going to bring those. Um, I keep going the wrong way. Sorry, guys. You know, if you're going to bring any of this information, these aren't very beautiful trees. They're not very interesting. And one note of warning, if you were thinking about these trees, is look at the tree. Let's ignore these trees in the foreground and look at the big tree behind it. That's a big mass of tree behind it. And look, it follows the shape of the trees in front of it. Isn't that annoying when yeah, trees do that? Be really careful with that. You got to, because otherwise people are going to read it. It's going to be confusing of who's where. So, um, you know, and I hadn't noticed that until just now. But um, things that you kind of, as you're analyzing your painting or your reference, you kind of, again, you break it down, you kind of look through, okay, I like what's going on here, but, you know, I'm going to do what Michelle did. I'm going to stand up instead of sit down and I'm going to be able to see this water because it gives me just a little more depth and it creates a better turn. Okay, I'm, these colors is what it's about, this contrast. So I'm going to play that up and, okay, what about the background? Whoa, oh, okay, this tree mimics the shape of these trees okay so just note to self gonna have to do something there you know move something or cut something or you know maybe like michelle's doing get rid of these trees at least now and okay what else is going on that i like so much why is this area so interesting and so effective when it's so high key right it's so light in value and it's just hinting at enough detail. But then what happens is it gets pretty cool pretty quickly as it comes down to the ground plane. I know because I go and paint in this area. Again, this is right around the corner from my house. Um, is that there's a whole bunch of blackberries and I think even ivy and stuff in here. So you got these little bushes and shrubs and mess. And then a line of midland trees and then these giant pine trees way back there. Um, and then it does open up. This is actually a house right here. I always take that house out. I don't think I've ever put it into any of the paintings I've done of this park. This is a place Brenda Boylan lives literally two blocks from this. So this is where when Brenda calls me in the evening, you want to go paint real quick? Yeah, okay, let's just go meet up at the Frog Pond is what we call this one. We've got the beaver pond, the frog pond, and the village pond, um, all within a couple blocks of our houses. And they're just easy, quick spaces. So anyways, nicely played. Michelle, tell us about your thoughts, please. Um, yeah, I, 
I had a lot of fun. I, I did it a little different. I didn't use the acrylic, but I had done all those little thumbnail sketches that were uh, and value studies that were, I think, based on this. Um, I don't know how I got that up higher. Is it that I needed to make the foregrounds taller? You just don't see the water really. It's barely hinted at here. Um, and then in yours, you just yep, let us see the water. I, I did change that left side and I'm working on the colors. Um, some of it I like and some of it I don't. I, I think the, the orange in the back uh, kind of looks a little mushy and I'm not sure if I need to do something about that, but it doesn't overall bother me. And I'm not sure if I should put trees in on the right. Um, yeah. Yep, I don't know. I don't really have advice as far as that, as Is, far as the mushiness here. If you want to, you can come back with a little bit of that value and delineate, differentiate, you know, basically paint back into these to give them a little stronger form if you want them. But look how soft and mushy that is. So that's up to you. What I want to show you here, look at this part right here, you guys, when I go back and forth between the paintings, see what's happening is this is rim light, right? Our light's coming from back here. It's hitting this red bush and it's showing just on the very tops and on the side on the back, just on the very tops, right? Just on the sides and top. So that's rim light. As we get a little further back, we do see a little bit more of the ground form, but now let's go see what Michelle did. We could walk across this, right? You Instead of doing rim light, you did it top light. Oh, keep going the wrong way. So again, now let's watch. See here, this looks like literally if there was a bridge, I could get over here and I could walk out to this point. Here I would be, you know, sinking in the bog or fighting these big rough patches of grass. So it's just by bringing the shadows up because on your other one over here, yeah, it's just, it's a matter of shadow. And it again, it doesn't bother me, Michelle. It is just a higher vantage point. So you've learned something accidentally, possibly, but that's it doesn't hurt your painting because you kept it pretty consistent. We're standing taller here. We're standing taller here. Ah, keep going the wrong way again. Um, if I were 10 feet tall or 12 feet tall, I would have had that view when I took this photo. And that's fine. And um, I often will do that of kind of looking at the scene and going, I wish I was a little bit taller, you know, or I wish I had a slightly different vantage point um, because maybe I have, and I do know, in fact, that, right, I'm standing as close as I can to this water and there's a whole bunch of debris, blackberry bushes actually. And they get in a lot of my photos and you've even seen me where I, the painting I did with the blackberry bushes is the same scene. Um, anyways, nicely is, done. Anybody? Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, is that a golf course off to the right? I was wondering in the reference. Yeah, that part. It's just a tiny little park, right? To the right of that is a whole bunch of apartment buildings, actually. This is a little cul-de-sac area with a whole bunch of young kids. And um, this pond is jam-packed with bullfrogs. It's really noisy. Um, but this park is just maybe a quarter acre of really nice lawn. And yeah, it does look weird. I personally usually rough it up, um, you know, make it look a little more natural so that people don't think I'm lazy and just walked around the corner of my neighborhood and stood beside an apartment building and painted this nice nature scene. Um, but that's, you know, I do like the colors. You know, I love that little bit of green really does something nice here. Um, you know, so you could bring it like you did a little bit in yeah, it's tough because I like that green. It's so beautiful against these warm brown reds, but it's it the fact that it's here makes my eye want to go. This is where my eye kind of wants to go. It'll do this kind of jump and swim through here, but this is kind of the exciting part. So it's kind of like, okay, how do we use some of that information over here? Maybe bringing a little bit of that green in here. If we wanted it, I could bring a little bit of that green back there if I wanted it. Um, you know, it's we're just taking and using notes, right? So nicely done. Anybody have anything else to add? 
I just want to say in Michelle's version, those colors are so satisfying. Aren't they? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. It really, again, when it's small or if you squint your eyes at it, it looks like a hazy photo. It's really nice. Very nice. Good job, Michelle. Good job, Michelle. All right, Sully, here's your painting again. Great. There's yeah, that was an early, earlier version. Good. Thank you for sharing progress shots. And I think we are kind of caught up. Um, did we talk about this one, Laura? Uh, I don't know. But we should get to your demo. Yeah, class is half over already. Um, <laughs> beautifully done. Let's just leave it at that. Awesome. I love the light kind of. I, and out. I thank the people who put in suggestions. They were very helpful. I actually redid the rocks in the foreground um, to keep it from tripping you up as you walk up the path. As somebody mentioned. <laughs> you say that this is a made up scene? Yes. Holy cow. All right. Well, good job on you. That's uh, impressive. Um, very Thank nice. You. Good job. Nice shapes. Nice uh, breaking up of space. Um, yeah, I mean, the rocks are a little interesting, definitely. Um, but I kind of like that this story that this tree tells of you know, how it's the rock slowly split due to whatever. And, you know, nature finds a way. I always like that saying and up it comes. I mean, it, this definitely tells a story unto itself right here. And then the rest of it's just nice and interesting. And yeah, your negative okay. shapes and sky holes. Um, I think we can all learn you're, you're quite good at them. I might urge that you, and I'm not saying you do in this one, but be weary of overusing them you're you know no, i don't <laughs> think you do but it is it's one of those things like every, what do you mean <laughs> that's really pretty that's really pretty um yeah nicely done yeah. these shapes are so interesting Thank you. this tree over here is just interesting it's like you're letting every single form have a personality and be its own thing um which is not easy to do we have to stay engaged with the painting while we're doing it to say, you know, all these trees are their own character. Um, one quick note, these, all these trees here end right at this branch. Oh yeah, good, good call. All right. I could look at that for a long time. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you. you know it's so funny about this one when I was looking at it as a thumbnail. I was like, it's so interesting that she put that pylon right in the middle of it. <laughs> it me of an old Maxfield, the Maxfield Parish paintings with the, you know, little thing. Right, right, right. It looks like Roman ruins or something. And I, a view from my window. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, very fun. I, I, is this one scene kind of scrolling across that you split? No, no. These are, these were the other, what were, we, what we're going to do two two small ones one what was it one light and one dark no one warm and one cool that's what it was one warm and one cool i think so i guess they're it's just so funny look how everything lines up besides the mountains the trees line up your grass is like it's just I thought know, it was it's, an art, it's an artifact of the exercise yep 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 nicely played all right i am going to uh, stop there if i missed anybody um i apologize um I have a, a suggestion. I don't know if it'll work. Um, but you said that when we glaze, it gets darker, right? So what if we glaze with white acrylic, a real watery mixture to light evenly lighten the entire painting before we glazed? Would that work? I don't know. I can speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it works to the point that you don't water it down so much that the acrylic has no medium because then when you do go, if there's not enough medium in the acrylic to hold that, um, pig, um, you know, the titanium powder onto your canvas, when you go to glaze with any other color, you'll just be picking them back up again. Um, and the other thing is, um, so use a, use a bit of medium and I like to use like real watery matte mediums I've found. Yeah, definitely um, matte medium. I did do the mistake of mixing a 
glazing medium, uh, gloss glazing medium into it, and the oil paints won't take. It's too slippery. Exactly, and then it won't absorb the oil paint um, tint okay. that you put in. Um, I and then was I was always told that you could put oil on acrylic, but not acrylic on oil. Correct. It just, Correct. It just Correct. wouldn't work as well as you want it to work. It will adhere for about a year and then it will right. start. And then it'll peel off nicely. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, right. it's a temporary it's fix. Kind of kind of like kind of like Banksy's painting that just shredded spontaneously. <laughs> yeah, Maybe yeah. that's the effect. No, and then the other thing. <laughs> yeah. You got paid a lot of money for that. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I was going to mention is that if you do, I, I have found that if you try and lighten up by putting white over, uh, and this is still when you're in the acrylic phase, you no know, oils have been introduced. Um, you probably want to keep it a little thinner than you think because you can get too much white on there and then, and then you're stuck having to repaint everything. Yeah, I think I understand the uh, idea behind what you're saying, Kat, but, or, yeah, Kathleen, but um, I think that it's, you know, and a, a white opaque or white, a titanium white is really a quite opaque color or, you know, paint, meaning it has pretty good coverage. So it's kind of like putting mayonnaise or milky over the top. It's not just going to lighten. It's going to make everything hazy feeling and... Uh, but if, any, if anybody's willing to experiment with that, let me know. Um, so we have an hour and a half. Um, these are two little paintings that I painted uh, last couple of days. Um, I kind of wanted to glaze into these really quickly. Are you guys willing to um, let me glaze really fast into these as kind of a warm up for the final painting? I'll do like about five, 10 minutes on each one of these. And we can sure. try. This one is the one I'm more interested in. This one's pretty typical of what I've been painting, but this one's actually face lit. These shadows are being cast by trees behind me. And then these are tops of trees that are getting really blasted by the setting sun. You can kind of see the shadows going across and into those. Um, so if you guys are willing, let's take a quick five minute break. And then I'm gonna spend about five minutes on each of these glazing in, and then I will bring up the final project. And uh, I'm very curious what we'll do with the final project because we'll paint by committee. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have about 45 minutes on the final painting, which will definitely allow me to really cover it and get some ideas worked out. So I'm just popping up my, I don't have printouts of these. Um, so I'm just gonna be looking at my monitor from pretty far away, but I think we can get it. Um, I'm just gonna run, refill my coffee. And uh, uh, I think we'll be gonna, ready to go. So are you gonna I, stop the recording and then start oh, again? Aren't you smart? All right. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs>